This video is going to cover magnetic fields part 2 for special higher physics 1b. We're going to start by looking at the Hall effect. One place where the Hall effect is applied is in the magnetic field sensor that you're going to be using in the laboratory exercise, magnetic fields and the slinky coil. So let's consider what happens if we have a piece of metal like this placed in the magnetic field. What we'll do is we'll run a current along let's call it the x-axis of the metal and we'll apply a magnetic field this way in the y direction. And let's consider a positive charge here and work out what force is that positive charge going to feel? Well we know that F is equal to QV cross B and as it's flowing in the current it'll have some drift velocity in the direction of the current. So you can see it's going to feel a magnetic force. In this case using the right hand rule that magnetic force will be up. So as it feels a magnetic force, it will respond to that magnetic force and it will move up to the top. And we'll get a collection of positive charges up the top here, which will mean that there's associated negative charges down the bottom. So you can see this is going to generate an electric field. So the electric field will be going like this inside the metal here. So that's going to cause this positive charge to feel an electric force downwards, so this will be Fe. And these charges will keep responding to these forces until the forces reach equilibrium, so until there is no overall force on the particle. So we have that Fb is equal to Fe. And the magnetic force is given by QVdB and the electric force is given by QE and we'll give it a little subscript H for the Hall electric field. So these Qs will cancel out and this will give us our Hall electric field. Now what we actually measure in things such as this magnetic field sensor is the voltage difference between the top and the bottom of the metal slab. So let's call this a distance D. So we know that the potential difference between two points is the electric field times the distance. So we have that the voltage difference, we'll call it the Hall voltage, is EHD which is equal to VdB times the distance, So where this is the drift velocity, which comes about due to the current. So we can easily measure D, that's the height of our piece of metal, B, the magnetic field, that's generally what we're trying to measure, VH, we measure the potential between the top and the bottom. So how can we write VD? Well, let's just remember what we did about charge density before. We said that the charge is equal to the charge density in the normal direction times the surface area times the time. And we know that current is just charge over time. So this tells us that the current is equal to J dot N delta S, where this is the area. We also saw that we can write J as the charge density times the drift velocity. And let's, instead of writing delta S, we'll write the more normal A, the surface area. So in this case, this would be the surface area here the surface area through which the current is passing. And finally, we can also, we can write this charge density as the size of each charge times the number of charge carriers per unit volume, VdA. So that's equal to I, and let's substitute that in for Vd here. So we have that our Hall voltage is equal to I, over QNA 
times BD. So if we want to call this distance here the thickness, we could write that our area, the area is TD, and this is BD, and so these Ds cancel out, and we've got IB over QNT, where T stands for the thickness. And N is the number of charge carriers. Per unit volume. So N is not too hard to calculate for some metals such as lithium, sodium, copper and silver which all give up one electron to the sea of electrons which conducts the current. So just by knowing the, the atomic mass and the density of those substances we can get the number of charge carriers per unit volume. For more complicated atoms, it is harder to work out how many electrons each atom is going to give up, and we'd need to use quantum mechanics. Let's do an example of this. Imagine that you have a rectangular copper strip 1.5 centimetres wide and 0 0.10 centimetres thick. So let's just draw it here. This is 0 0.10 centimetres, this is 1.5 centimetres, here's our magnetic field B, here's our current I. And we're told that I is equal to 5.0 amps and B is equal to 1.2 teslas. The magnetic field is applied in the direction perpendicular to the strip. We're told that the density of copper is equal to 8920 kilograms per meter cubed and that the molar mass of copper, or the atomic mass, is 0.0635 kilograms per mole. And we're asked to find the Hall voltage. So we'll need to use the equation that we derived we'll need to use that the Hall voltage is equal to IB over NQT. Now we've got the current, we've got the magnetic field, we've got the thickness. We know that the charge carriers are electrons, so their charge is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. So what we need to work out is the number of charge carriers per unit volume. So to do that, we can use the density and the molar mass. The density over the molar mass will give us the number of moles per meter cubed. And what we need is the number of atoms per meter cubed. So if we times that by Avogadro's number, we'll actually end up with the number of atoms per meter cubed. So we've got 8920 over 0 0.0635 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23, which gives us 8.459 times 10 to the 28 atoms per meter cubed, which is also the number of electrons or charge carriers per meter cubed. So now we can just substitute everything in here. So we've got that our Hall voltage is equal to I, which is 5.0, times 1.2 over... 8.459 times 10 to the 28 times 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 times the thickness, which is 0 0.10 times 10 to the minus 2. And then solving that on the calculator, we end up with 4.4 times 10 to the minus 7 volts, which we could write if we wanted 0 0.44 microvolts. So a very small potential difference and a very large magnetic field. So these voltage differences are very small, but it is possible to measure them. What we're going to look at now is the force between two current carrying wires. We're going to imagine that we have wire 1, which is K1, 
carrying a current I1 and we have wire 2 carrying a current I2. We'll say that they're a distance D apart. We know that a current carrying wire feels a force in the magnetic field given by F is equal to I L cross B. So what we can do is if at wire 2 we work out the magnetic field due to wire 1, we can then use that to get the force on wire 2 due to wire 1. So at wire 2, let's consider what the magnetic field will be due to wire 1. Wire 1 will have a magnetic field going into the page at wire 2. And the magnetic field strength there will be given by mu naught i over 2 pi d. This is from the expression that we derived from the Biot-Savart law for an infinitely long wire. We'll be seeing an easier way to derive it in a little while, but that's where it comes from. So now what we can do is we can substitute in our values here. So this is talking about the current through wire 2, so that's I2. We'll consider a length L of these wires, so L. So we've got L. Now the size of the magnetic field is mu naught, and this is I1 over 2 pi d and the angle between the flow of current and the magnetic field is 90 degrees so for the cross product we'll have sine 90 which is 1 and let's just consider the direction as the this is the direction of the current so to the right and the magnetic field is going into the page this force is going to be upwards towards wire 1 So we can write this as mu naught over 2 pi L I1 I2 over D. And this force, if the currents are flowing in the same direction, they'll be towards each other, as in this case. If the currents are flowing in the opposite direction, then the magnetic field here will have the same direction, but the current will be opposite, and so the force will be in the opposite direction. So towards each other when current is in the same direction and away from each other when the current is in the opposite direction. So that is how you calculate the force between two parallel current carrying wires. What we're going to look at now is an easier way to calculate this. Okay, what we're going to be looking at is something called Ampere's Law. Ampere's Law is a little like Gauss's Law except that it's for magnetic fields. So we've got B dot DS. So B is the magnetic field. DS, in this case, we're considering a loop. So this is a path. Rather than being an area, which is what it was in Gauss's law, it's now a path. And this is equal to mu naught I enclosed, where this is the current enclosed by the path. Now, this is equivalent to Maxwell's third law in the electrostatics case grad cross B is equal to mu naught J. We're not going to show how those are equivalent now because that involves a lot of vector calculus, but this is equivalent. Now, as with Gauss's law, this is only useful in specific situations. Those are generally situations where we have a lot of symmetry. The Biot-Savart law will always work, but Ampere's law is much easier to use if you can. Let's first of all consider a situation where it's not especially useful. Imagine that you have a current carrying wire carrying the current into the page and here's another current carrying wire with the same current coming out of the page. Let's draw a path around here 
and can we get the magnetic field around this path using Ampere's law? Well, the simple answer is no, we can't because we cannot make the assumption that the magnetic field is constant around this path. Clearly, the magnetic field around this wire we know is going to be looking like this and the magnetic field around this wire will be going in the opposite direction so it wouldn't be reasonable to assume that a little increment dB here is the same as a little increment dB here those are not equal, there's not enough symmetry and if we were to work out what BDS was it would in this case be zero but that doesn't mean that the magnetic field is zero everywhere. It just means that as you go around the path, the magnetic field lines going into the page will cancel out with the magnetic field lines coming out of the page. So Ampere's law is often not useful. Let's look at a few situations though where it is useful. Let's first of all consider a long current carrying wire. We'll let it have a radius R and it's got constant current density. With current I flowing through it. Let's assume that the current is flowing up out of the screen at us and what we need to do is work out B for radiuses less than the radius of the wire and work out B for radiuses greater than or equal to the radius of the wire. Okay so first of all considering a radius inside the wire here's our little r we know from Ampere's law that B dot ds is equal to mu naught i enclosed. So what we need to do is work out how much current is enclosed. We know that the current density is constant over this wire here and across the entire area the current flowing through is i. Only part of that current i though will be passing through this loop here. So we have I enclosed is equal to the area of enclosed by the loop over the area of the wire, the cross-sectional area of the wire, times I. So that is equal to pi R squared, little r squared, over pi big R squared times I. So it's equal to little r squared over big R squared times I. Okay, now we know that magnetic field lines go in circles around a wire so it's reasonable to assume that B is going to be constant at a fixed radius from this wire so we can pull B out the front of this integral we've got then got the path integral around this path now to work out B dot ds strictly speaking we do need to know the direction of the path but let's just take the direction of the path as the same direction as the magnetic field which is what you do wherever possible so there's our direction of the path and this is equal to mu naught little r squared over big R squared i. So this just means the path length. So in this case it's the circumference of the circle. So we've got b times 2 pi r is equal to mu naught r squared on r squared i. The little r's will cancel out and we end up with b is equal to mu naught over 2 pi r over capital R squared i. And that tells us the magnetic field inside the wire. Let's now calculate the magnetic field for R is bigger than the radius of the wire. So that's this green one. We can take a path like this. So in this case, we've got B dot ds is equal to mu naught I enclosed. And the amount of current enclosed is just the I. So we've, and once again, we can assume that the magnetic field is going to be constant here, so we can pull it out the front of the integral. So we've got 
B times the integral around the path is equal to mu naught i. And the integral around the path is just the circumference, so 2 pi r. And so we have B is equal to mu naught i over 2 pi r. And that is in very few lines of working compared with the bias of art law where we had to do a lot of working to get to that expression. So when we can use Ampere's law, it's very powerful and saves us a lot of time. Let's now consider another situation where we can use Ampere's law. We can use Ampere's law to work out the magnetic field inside a toroid. So a toroid is a big loop. We'll say it has radius b, and it's made of some circle. It's donut shaped. So we'll call the radius of the material making up the toroid a. And what we want to do is work out the magnetic field inside the toroid, so around some loop like this. So let's draw a loop with radius r inside the toroid. We'll choose a direction like that. And to make this a toroid, we have a wire flowing current current around the outside. So, so the current's flowing like this. We've got n loops of wire. And what we want to know is what is B inside the toroid. OK, so we've got B dot ds, that's the magnetic field around this path, is equal to mu naught i enclosed. OK, now the magnetic field Let's just consider how each of these loops of wire is going to contribute to the magnetic field. You can see each of these loops is going to have some magnetic field going through its middle in this direction. So B and DS are in opposite directions, they're anti-parallel. So in this case we would end up with a negative sign. So we've got this magnetic field is constant around this path so we can pull it out the front of our integral. So we've got B times the circumference of the path, the integral of ds, which is 2 pi r, is equal to mu naught. Now, the current enclosed, we've got n of these loops, each carrying a current i. So this is equal to n i. So we've got b is equal to mu naught n i over 2 pi r. Now, really, this is a negative as they're going in opposite directions. But that negative doesn't really mean anything. What we should do is state the direction of this magnetic field. So this is going clockwise when we're looking at it from on top. So going clockwise when observed from on top. So this is the magnetic field in here, and you can see it does have some R dependence. So it's not actually constant with radius, it is dropping off as we get further from the centre of the toroid. Now one interesting thing to think about is what's going to be the magnetic field in the centre here. Because if we look at this, we've got B dot ds is equal to mu naught i enclosed here. There is no enclosed current, and so we have no magnetic field following this path here. But that's all we can say. It doesn't mean that there is absolutely no magnetic field in the center here. It just means that there's no magnetic field flowing in the plane of the toroid. There is a very weak magnetic field in the middle here, but it's flowing perpendicular to the loop, not around the loop like this, which is why B dot ds is zero. One final case that we can use Ampere's law for is a solenoid. So a solenoid is a coil of wire, something like this. And we can draw an Amperian loop through the middle of the coil like this to work out the magnetic field in the middle of the solenoid. Now I'm going to leave this as an exercise to you 
You can do this by making the assumption that the magnetic field is equal to zero out along this part of your Amperian path. Along here we've got B dot ds is equal to zero as the magnetic field and the loop are perpendicular to each other so the magnetic field lines are going in this direction not in not up and down the page and so the only contribution to the integral b dot ds comes from this part of the path along here so use this to work out the magnetic field in the center of a solenoid what we're going to look at now is Gauss's law in magnetism. Now with electric fields we said that the electric flux was equal to E dot dA, the integral over the surface. With magnetic fields it's exactly the same, the magnetic flux is equal to B dot dA. Now we were considering closed surfaces for electric fluxes and we said that around a closed surface if we have some charge here then the magnetic flux was equal to the enclosed charge over epsilon naught and to have any flux through this closed surface to have a total flux through the enclosed surface we had to have some enclosed charge so that we could have electric field lines cutting through that surface. Let's consider what happens with magnets because magnets are a bit different they're always found as a north and a south pole together so we draw the magnetic field lines coming out of the north pole and into the south pole but really we should draw them as continuous lines so they continue through the magnet like this so that's clear that that's what happens in the solenoid you should have just shown that but it also happens in a bar magnet so now let's consider trying to draw a closed path now let's consider drawing a closed surface around our magnet and let's see if we can work out how to draw one such that we have more lines entering or leaving it and not an equal number. If we draw a surface such as this, so imagine that this is a three-dimensional surface, then we've got two lines leaving and two lines entering. If we draw it up here, again we've got one line entering and one line leaving. If we draw a surface here, we've got two lines entering and two lines leaving. However we draw the surface, because magnetic field lines always form loops, we'll actually always have the same number of magnetic field lines entering and leaving each surface. So what that tells us is that this integral around any closed surface of B dot dA has to be zero. And this is actually Maxwell's fourth equation. And the result of this equation is that it's not possible to have a magnetic monopole. There's no way we can have just a north pole, like we can just have a positive charge here. Now, one place where this can actually be useful is if we have a constant magnetic field. And you have some weird shaped surface, for example, this hemisphere, that you have to work out the flux through. So if you ask what's um, phi b through surface, then what you can do is replace this green surface with the red one here. If you place, replace it with a flat plate so that this forms a closed surface, then you know that b dot dA is equal to zero. And it's easy to work out the flux through the red surface, phi b, because these are all perpendicular, would just be equal to ba. And so the flux through the green surface would be the negative of the flux through the red surface, because they add, have to add together to give zero. So this is an example of where you may use this Gauss's law in magnetism.
Now we're going to look at Faraday's law of induction. Faraday's law states that the induced EMF, which is the voltage, is equal to minus d phi b dt, where phi b is the magnetic flux through a surface. If we have n loops of wire, then this becomes minus n d phi b dt, where n is equal to the number of loops. Now this negative sign here is actually very important. It's even given its own name, Lenz's Law. And what the negative sign says is that the induced EMF opposes the change that induces it. So the magnetic flux through a surface is generally equal to BA. That's assuming that the magnetic field is constant over the surface. And so usually in these questions, either B will be varying or A will be varying. So it would be possible to have both varying with time. Let's look at a couple of examples. Okay, example one. This is on page seven of the lecture notes. A loop of wire enclosing an area A is placed in a region where the magnetic field is perpendicular to the plane of the loop. So we have a loop of wire like this and the magnetic field is perpendicular to that plane and constant. The magnetic field B varies in time according to the expression B is equal to B max E to the minus AT. So when we said constant, we meant constant in space, not constant in time, where A is constant. At t equals 0, it has the value B max. And we need to find the induced EMF in the loop as a function of time. So we know that the induced EMF is equal to minus d phi B dt. So this is equal to minus d B A, as the magnetic field is constant in space. We can replace it with this. Now the area of the loop is not changing, so this is equal to minus a dB dt. Now all we need to do is substitute in for b, and we have that our EMF is equal to minus a times the derivative of b max e to the minus a t dt, and so this is equal to a a b max e to the minus a t. So you can see the negative sign here cancels with the negative sign that we got when we differentiated this. So we end up with a positive value. So as t goes to infinity, we have e to the minus infinity here. And so this goes to 0. And so we have that the EMF goes to 0, which is what we would expect. Example 2. In this example, we have a constant through time and space magnetic field, B. We have a couple of conductive frictionless rods like this, and they're joined together with a wire with a resistor R on it. And we have another bar here, is initially moving with vi, initial velocity, it's got a mass m and we're told the conducting bar illustrating the figure moves on two frictionless parallel rails in the presence of a uniform magnetic field directed into the page. The bar has mass m and length l, so this length here is l and we'll call this length from here to here x. The bar is given an initial velocity vi to the right and is released at time t equals zero. Part a, use Newton's laws, find the velocity of the bar as a function of time. Okay, so what we need to do is work out what force is acting on this bar. So the force is going to be some magnetic force 
and because it comes about due to an induced current, it's going to have to oppose the change that induces it. So it will have to oppose this initial velocity. So we'll have some force here, Fb, trying to slow it down. So we know that the magnetic force is equal to I L cross B. And we can see that the length and the magnetic field are perpendicular to each other. So this is going to be equal to I L B and it will be slowing it down. So what we need to do now is we know what L is, we know what B is, B is some constant thing that we're told. So we need to work out what I is. So to work out what I is, what we can do is use Faraday's law of induction. We know that the EMF is equal to minus d phi b dt. And so this is equal to minus d b a dt. And the magnetic field is constant, so we've got minus b d a. Now, the area of this loop is equal to L x. And L, the length of the rod is not changing, it's just the x that is changing. So this is equal to minus B L D X D T. And this is equal to minus B L V, where V is the velocity of the bar along these rails. So this is equal to the EMF, which is the voltage difference. And we know that the voltage difference is equal to the current times the resistance. So the current times the resistance is equal to minus B L V which tells us that the current is equal to minus B L V on R. Now the minus sign here is indicating the direction of the current. So the induced current will have to be flowing up like this to create a force in this direction. So this negative is not too important because it's just really telling us about the direction of this current. So what we have substituting this back into here is the magnetic force is equal to I, which is B L V on R times L B, which is equal to B squared L squared V over R. And this is equal to, from Newton's second law, M A, which is M, and then rather than just write A, because the acceleration is not constant with time, we'll put the acceleration as dV dt v is the velocity. And we know that it, this force is in the opposite direction to the velocity. So we should have a negative sign here. It's opposing the velocity. So now we have a differential equation here that we can solve. We've got b squared l squared over mr dt is equal to dv over v and we've got a negative sign and then we know at time 0 it's got velocity vi at time t it's got velocity vf so we can write b squared l squared over mrt is equal to minus log of vf over vi which tells us that the final velocity is equal to e to the minus b squared l squared t over mr times vi. So that is an expression for our velocity at time t. So as the time goes to infinity, this is going to slow down and the velocity will approach zero. So in part b of this question, we need to show that the same result is found using an energy approach. So we need to compare the electrical energy, which the only part of this circuit with any resistance is this resistor here. So the electrical energy is lost here. We need to compare that electrical energy loss with the kinetic energy loss of the bar. So we've got P is equal to VI. So we can write that as epsilon I. And this rate of energy loss should be equal to d of a half mv squared dt. Now, to get this in terms of what we know, epsilon is equal to ir, so this is i squared r, and i we've got over here. So we've got b squared l squared v squared over r squared times r. 
is equal to the derivative of this. So when we take the derivative of this, we've got a half m, which is constant with time, and then we've got times 2v dv dt. So this half and this 2 will cancel out. We've got 1v here, which will cancel with 1v here. And so we can write b squared l squared on r, this r squared, one of them cancels with that r on m. We'll move this down here. dt is equal to dv over this v. And you can see this is exactly the same as this derivative over here. So we can integrate those the same way. And so this is the same as part A. And then this is an energy loss, so we've got the minus there. So same as part A, so we can either do this through energy considerations or through force considerations. So now we're going to look at induced EMF and electric fields. So we've been looking at induced EMF and magnetic flux, but now we're going to see how this relates to electric field. So moving a magnet, changing the magnetic flux in a given region, induces an electric field in space. This electric field is what causes the current to flow through a loop of wire. This electric field is non-conservative. It does work on charges. Imagine a circular loop of wire with radius r. So as a magnet is moved near it, a potential difference epsilon is induced in the loop. So a charged particle, let's take a, we'll take an electron, moves around the loop. So it goes around like this. Once around the loop as a result of the induced field. We're now going to consider how much energy it needs to move around that loop. Okay, so to move around the loop it has to do work to overcome the induced electric field. So the amount of work it has to do is equal to Q times the integral of E dot dS, the electric field around this loop. And we know that this is going to be equal to the amount of electrical energy that it expends. So we have P is equal to VI, which is equal to epsilon, which is just the V, times Q on T, and this is equal to the energy over time. So the electrical energy, E, is equal to epsilon Q. So this is equal to the induced EMF times Q. So these Qs will cancel out, and we end up with the induced EMF is equal to E dot dS. And now for this case, we're going around the loop, and so we've got that our induced EMF is equal to 2 pi R times the electric field. And from Faraday's law, we know that the induced EMF is equal to minus d phi b dt. So this is minus d. Now the area is pi r squared, and this is b dt, and that's equal to 2 pi r e. Now pi r squared is not changing, so we have minus pi r squared db dt is equal to 2 pi r e. And so cancelling off one of these r's and the pi, we end up with the electric field is equal to r over 2 minus r on 2 db dt. So for a circular loop of wire, this tells us what electric field is induced by a changing magnetic field. Now the general form of Faraday's law is that the work done to move a charge around a closed loop is equal to Q times the induced EMF, which is equal to Q minus d phi b dt, which is equal to the work done around the path E dot ds. And so the general form of Faraday's law is E dot ds is equal to minus d phi b dt. 
So whenever we have a changing magnetic field, we'll end up with an electric field being induced. So let's do an example of how we use this equation. So this example is on page 8 of the lecture notes. A long solenoid of radius r, so let's sketch r solenoid. Here's the loops of wire. It's got radius r, has n turns per unit length. and carries a time varying current that varies sinusoidally as I is equal to I max cos omega t where omega is the angular frequency. So this is a very common form of current. Alternating currents vary as cos and sine functions. So part A of the question says determine the magnitude of the induced electric field outside the solenoid at a distance little r is bigger than the radius of the solenoid from its long central axis. So what we're doing now is we're choosing our radius out here and so we'll have a path going around like that. We'll choose a circular path and we need to work out the induced electric field around this path. So what we have is E dot ds is equal to minus d phi b dt. Now to solve this we're going to need to make an assumption. We're going to assume that the magnetic field is all contained within the solenoid and that there's no magnetic field out here. Okay, now this assumption is not entirely valid. If little r is close to big R, then it's a good approximation. As our radiuses get bigger and bigger, it's going to be a worse and worse approximation. So to solve this, we'll assume that the electric field is constant. So we have E times the integral ds, which is E times the circumference, so that's E times 2 pi r. And this is equal to minus d ba dt. Now the only area through which we have a changing magnetic field is inside the solenoid because we've said we're going to assume that outside it's zero. So this area is referring to the area inside the solenoid because b times all of the area outside is zero. So this is equal to minus pi r squared db dt. Now, for a solenoid, we've shown that the magnetic field B is equal to mu naught ni. You showed this with Ampere's law. It was left as an exercise for you. So for, in this case, we'll have mu naught ni max cos omega t. So we can substitute this into here and we have E times 2 pi R is equal to minus pi capital R squared D mu naught Ni max cos omega T dt. So doing this derivative, let's cancel off the pi's. We've got minus well, when we differentiate cos, we end up with minus sign. So the minus will actually cancel out. So we've got the I, r squared mu naught n i max times omega sine omega t. And that is equal to E times 2r. And so our electric field induced at radiuses little r is equal to r squared over 2r mu naught n i max omega sine omega t. Now part b of the question says what is the magnitude of the induced electric field inside the solenoid at a distance little r from its axis. So let's choose little r inside now. So when we do that we end up with this same 
we'll be substituting into this same equation here. So we've got e times 2 pi r is equal to minus dBa dt. Now the a in this case is pi r squared because it's only the area inside the loop that we're considering the flux through dt and this b is the same as this magnetic field here because it's the magnetic field induced in the middle of the solenoid. So substituting in there we can pull the pi r squared out the front and we've got d mu naught n i max cos omega t dt and so differentiating this we end up with pi r squared mu naught n i max sine omega t and that is equal to e times 2 pi r pi's cancel one of these r's cancel and this tells us that the electric field is equal to mu naught n i max r sine omega t over 2 so we've now managed to derive the electric field based on the information about the changing magnetic field. The final topic we're going to look at is self-inductance and induction. So when a current is switched on through a solenoid or any circuit, a magnetic field develops. This magnetic field changes over time and it induces a current and this current is going to oppose the change that it induces it. So it's going to oppose that initial current. So as a result, the measured current in the circuit is less than the current set up by the power source. This induced EMF is proportional to the changing magnetic flux, which in turn is generated by and hence proportional to the changing current. So we can write that the induced EMF is equal to minus L di dt. So it's proportional to the current that is inducing it. And this proportionality constant is called the inductance. And it's actually measured in, in the units, the Henry. So using Faraday's law, we can say that this is equal to minus N d phi b dt and so we have that minus n phi b is equal to minus l i we get that just by integrating both of these over time and so the inductance l is equal to n phi b over i so let's consider a circuit in this circuit we've got some supplied power so it's got an emf epsilon the power flows through a resistor and then through a solenoid or some other inductor. So this resistor has resistance R, this solenoid or inductor has an inductance L. And we can say that the supplied EMF epsilon goes into power here, so that is equal to IR. And then we've also got the EMF across this inductor, which is given by L di dt. So the supplied EMF is used up by two things. It's used up by the resistor and by the inductor. So now considering energy and power, we know that the rate of power loss is given by Vi. So we have I epsilon, this is the amount of power supplied by the power supply, is equal to I squared R, that's the amount of power lost across this resistor, plus Li di dt, this will be the rate at which energy is stored in the inductor. So that tells us that du dt is equal to li di dt, where u is the energy stored in the inductor. So integrating both over time, we end up with du is equal to li 
di and then we want to integrate initially there is no power stored there's no energy stored in the inductor that's when the current is zero at some later time the current has risen to i so at the time the current has reached i we've got an amount of energy u stored so we've got u is equal to a half l i squared so this tells us how much energy is stored in an inductor. So one final example. This is on page 9 of your lecture notes. Coaxial cables are often used to connect electrical devices such as your video system and in receiving signals in television cable systems. Model a long coaxial cable as a thin cylindrical conducting shell of radius B. So here we've got this thin shell like this. It's got radius B. And inside we've got a solid cylinder of radius A. So this has got radius A. The conductors carry the same current I, but in opposite directions. So there we've got I, there we've got I going in the opposite direction. Calculate the inductance L of a length L of this cable. So this is the length, it's a little L. And we need to calculate the inductance big L. So to do this, we'll need to use our equation L is equal to N phi B over I. But n in this case is 1. We don't have multiple loops of wire here. We've just got the one wire. So this is equal to phi b on i. So what we need to do now is work out what is this magnetic flux through here. Okay, now, we know from Ampere's law that outside here, up here, b is equal to 0 because the enclosed current is equal to 0. So what we're going to do is we're now going to consider the flux through a rectangle like this. So this rectangle has length L along here and it's got length R, the radius, in this direction. And so this flux is referring to our flux through this rectangular cross section here. So let's work out what that is phi of b will equal the integral of b dot dA and dA will be equal to b, L isn't changing and that's times dR. Now inside here we have got a wire carrying a current I so we know that that produces a magnetic field b is equal to mu naught I over 2 pi R. We derived this with Ampere's law and also with the bias of art law. So we can substitute this in for our magnetic field here. So let's pull the mu naught I over 2 pi out and the L at the front and then we've got the integral of dr over R. So now we're actually we're considering the magnetic flux in this part of our coaxial cable. So our radius is going from A to B. So we can write this as mu naught I over 2 pi L. And then when we integrate this, we'll get log. And it'll be log B minus log A. So that's log B on A. So substituting this in for our inductance up here, we've got L is equal to mu naught i over 2 pi. Now let's put this i down here. L log b over a. And so this i cancels this i and we end up with mu naught over 2 pi. L log b over a. So this tells us the inductance of this cable here. And that's the end of this video and the end of this part of the course.